Good morning and welcome to our coverage of the Israel-Hamas war. I'm Alumide McCauley. Coming up today... Hamas releases video purportedly showing Israeli tanks struck by shells as Israeli army displays weapons used by Hamas during October 7 attack. Israel-Hamas war dominates talks during Saudi Defense Minister's visit to Washington. U.S. House blocks censure of Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib over Israel comments. Thank you for joining us. The Hamas military wing has published a video showing what it describes as anti-armor shells fired towards Israeli tanks and vehicles in Gaza. The terrorists declared in a statement that the tanks were targeted by Yassin 105 shells. Israeli tanks have been acting in Gaza for at least four days following weeks of air bombardments in retaliation for Hamas attack on October the 7th. Israeli President Isaac Herzog has been exhorting fellow citizens to stand united and steadfast as his country wages its war against Hamas in the Gaza Strip. He warns that the enemy is seeking to kindle hatred between the country's Jewish majority and its Arab minority. Israeli ground forces supported by air and sea have moved into parts of the Gaza Strip where they've encountered resistance. Meanwhile, the Israeli army had displayed a large cache of weapons and supplies it claims to have obtained from Hamas following the attack on October the 7th. The weapons seized including Hamas RPGs, thermobaric grenades, rockets and other weaponry. The, the Hamas took more than 200 hostages after their October 7 attack. For example, this one here, you see what we see here is a different type of uh, explosives, uh, of charges. For example, this one here is a thermobaric grenade that uh, was used to burn rooms inside the houses. Uh, they used a, a timed de detonator that is screwed here, just pull out the safety, throw this into a room, close the door, shut, and uh, it uh, takes the temperature inside the room to 3,000 degrees during the explosion burns, incinerates everything inside the room, nothing comes out. We've seen many of those being used and we collected many of those uh, that uh, weren't used uh, in the field. This, you should notice the sheer amount of uh, launchers. Though this type of equipment is being used in the field to hurt tanks and uh, personnel carriers, but those were used in the, during the attack on houses on uh, the kindergarten that we've seen in schools. We see here the different types of uh, rockets that uh, were used. Joining us virtually is researcher Institute for Security Studies, South Africa, Mr. Dennis Riva. Good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you for having me. The Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, says that this is the second phase of the ground incursion into Gaza. It has taken a very, um, I shall say, different dimension from what others would have thought that they will do a very protracted and far-covering invasion. But it seems to be targeted, it seems to be deliberate, it seems to be, it seems to be a game plan. And from the way the tanks that have moved from Israel into Gaza are positioned, the allegations that they're trying to cut off the north from the south of Gaza. As this conflict continues, what's your impression about the methods that Israel is using to target Hamas? Well, we're seeing uh, a number of, of tactics being deployed by, by the IDF. Um, We've seen some uh, targeted bombing uh, being used. Uh, and unfortunately, of course, 
um, there was quite a number of uh, civilian casualties that that resulted as as as, as a consequence of these bombings. Um, and uh, the understanding is that uh, Israel is see uh, sees these sort of casualties as a necessary cost of uh, fighting fighting Hamas. Um, it's difficult to predict at this moment in time what uh, the ground operation, how it will look like, uh, because um, uh, there, is a, there is a good quote, of course, that um, any good strategy uh, is tested by the battlefield and, and doesn't survive uh, the battlefield. So whatever plan exists at the moment in time, it will be amended <clears throat> to fit the realities on the ground. Um, Gaza is a very uh, highly urbanized uh, area. Um, and fighting in an urban environment is very difficult. So uh, we, we will likely see a change to tactics. But overall, um, I think we will continue seeing uh, uh, the bombardments. We will continue seeing uh, the use of drones and, and airplanes to deliver these strikes, uh, supported by an operation on the ground. Uh, how would we look over? It's, it's difficult to predict. Military experts seem to insinuate that from the first phase it, and the air raids, it's been a... Uh, uh, a sort of advanced party so as to feel the pulse of the situation as it were before a more a, a greater number of troops are sent in to overwhelm Hamas but knowing that Hamas has been ready for this incursion and likely as you've mentioned the urban warfare that may entail a, a great loss of life to Israeli troops that possibly is the reason why they're being deliberate, deliberate and slow about this uh, incursion, you think? No, of course. Uh, not to mention that any sort of urban warfare, despite having uh, tremendous difficulties and challenges uh, that it poses to, to an invading side or, or the side that is uh, involved in the assault, uh, is very taxing on the civilian population. I mean, you have uh, people living in high-rise buildings or uh, 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 urban uh, urban environment, and it's it's tremendously difficult to separate uh, the Hamas fighters who are being targeted by the IDF from the civilian population. Um, perhaps one uh, one reason why we are seeing such a slow uh, slow pace of this uh, of this operation is because uh, the IDF is being careful in terms of not uh, inflicting uh, tremendous uh, civilian casualties, not just because of, of uh, uh, you know, not just because they, they are reluctant to kill civilians, but also because of the optics of, uh, of uh, delivering these sort of uh, high civilian casualties as a result of the invasion. Um, so I think that's one of the aspects, uh, certainly it's, uh, and as you mentioned, of course, the other one is, is the uh, potential risks of losing uh, soldiers, uh, uh, IDF soldiers in this invasion. So um, I think they will continue with this slow, uh, slow incursion uh, until they feel they're ready to to strike. But once again, I don't think if 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 the war in Ukraine has taught us anything, uh, the urban warfare and modern ur urban warfare is very challenging and difficult. Um, there's no good way of executing it without losing your soldiers and killing civilians. Um, so it's it's quite a messy operation. So it, it makes sense they approach it in a very uh, sort of gradual and slow uh, manner. Is there anything that can be done by the United Nations or the international community mm -hmm. to prevent this war from becoming a long protracted war? Tentatively, yes, but I don't think there is an appetite necessarily. Uh, I mean. Uh, the the uh, Palestinian Palestinian crisis and, and the wider sort of Palestinian and Israeli crisis has been uh, has been going on for a while, and I think most states and most uh, most people have very set ideas on this war, um, and ultimately um, there is there is no common middle ground when it comes to Israel and Palestine. So it is it is a bit challenging um, to, to find this political diplomatic solution to this conflict. There's certainly a lot that can be done to, to mitigate uh, the loss of civilian lives. There's a lot that can be done to, to reduce uh, the risks uh, for the civilian population and the suffering of the civilians in Gaza. Um, but again, uh, the political component seeps in and, and, and affects the positions of the parties. Um, we may see uh, perhaps uh, 
greater efforts from, from the regional powers uh, who are certainly uh, quite interested and quite involved in this conflict uh, to, to, to perhaps offer a, a diplomatic or at least a sort of a peacemaking solution uh, that would not be favorable for either Gaza or, or either either Palestine, Hamas, or um, or Israel, but but it would it might prevent uh, it might prevent further loss of, of civilian lives, and that may be uh, perhaps in the deployment of uh, peacekeeping uh, peacekeeping troops from from the region. Um, but at this point in time, I, 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 um, it's difficult to predict. The situation changes every day. I mean, we uh, we still don't know. Um, whether Hezbollah, for instance, will join the conflict. Um, there is apparently a very big announcement set to, to, to take place uh, tomorrow. Um, and, and some people uh, speculate that perhaps we will see Hezbollah joining the war. And if that happens, uh, uh, that may change uh, the situation on the ground. It may change the uh, the positions uh, and, and uh, the involvement of, of the regional parties, but also parties uh, outside of the region uh, with regard to the involvement in this in this conflict. Um, so as the situation changes, it is a bit difficult to, to predict, uh, but, but there's certainly steps that can be taken by, by the regional powers and the powers outside to, to mitigate some of, the, some of the challenges and risks to the civilian population. Is enough pressure being brought to bear on Hamas to release the hostages? Um, again, um, on the one hand, yes, there is a pressure. On the one, and on the other hand, as I mentioned, the the uh, sort of the uh, polarized positions that that countries have towards this issue sort of prevent a more honest and open discussion. Um, usually, uh, the issue of hostages being taken is not a very uh, is not a very gray area. It's a very black and white issue, of course. But uh, as as the political ideologies or political positions uh, affect uh, affect the way uh, countries and, and people perceive this conflict, there seems to be uh, a, more of a more of a um, more of an approach that tends to tends to um, favor uh, uh, the Palestinian or the Hamas uh, approach to, to this war and, and where, where excuses are being made for, for Hamas uh, to take to, 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 uh, to be uh, executing this sort of action when it comes to the war they, they've waged. Um, I think uh, eventually um, it's inevitable uh, that, that we will see we will see probably a release of most of these uh, of these um, of these hostages being being how it, it's it's um okay we can hear you mr Riva. please go ahead okay no as, as i mentioned um yes. i don't think there's not pressure right now but eventually <clears throat> because uh the issue of, of uh hostages is linked to to uh eight uh and, and uh, uh, humanitarian support for, for civilians in Gaza, uh, we probably will see more effort being taken to release these, uh, these hostages. And as I said, it's a very, uh, from what I, from the way I see it, it's, it's a very black and white issue. We shouldn't be discussing whether it's, it's, uh, it's uh, um, moral or normatively correct to take hostages. I don't think it's, it's a very contentious uh, point to make. So um, I think we'll see more pressure being being uh, put on, on uh, Hamas uh, to release these prisoners, especially in, in the context of uh, more humanitarian aid coming into, into Gaza. Uh, yeah. In the October 7 terrorist attack on Israel, do you, uh, in your eyes, was the, the objective of Hamas right now, is it clear? What is their objective, you think? This is uh, a very challenging, difficult question. Uh, it's it's very difficult to to say precisely. I'm sure there has been a calculation in place uh, by the Hamas leadership of they they should have expected this sort of reaction from uh, Israel. Perhaps they expected uh, the regional powers to to play a bigger role. And again, as I mentioned, Hezbollah is said to make um, to make a statement uh, uh, tomorrow. And we don't know what the statement may look like, but we've already seen um, Iranian support uh, Houthi uh, uh, um, uh, rebels uh, declaring uh, declaring sort of a, a, a uh, to be part of this war and launching uh, missiles and drones.
towards Israel. Uh, we can expect something similar happening with Hezbollah, although some experts uh, argue to, to what extent Hezbollah uh, is ready to join this war. Uh, but perhaps there was a calculation, uh, a calculated uh, 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 step by, by uh, Hamas to, to get the regional parties involved, perhaps to get Iran involved and, and broader uh, regional uh, parties in this conflict. Um, it's, it's difficult to say, uh, I'll be very honest with you. Um, it, all we can do is speculate and see uh, sort of the trends and signs, but uh, it's, it's difficult to say for sure what, what the thinking was behind it. Perhaps uh, a, a regional, uh, to unite a region um, behind uh, the Palestinian cause. Um, for instance, I mean, if you consider it, Palestine has disappeared from the agenda uh, 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 in this region uh, since the Arab Spring. Uh, Palestine was simply not issued high on the agenda and the discussions. And, and what the attack on the 7th of October did, it brought uh, the issue of Palestine back on the agenda to the point where regional powers uh, are, are now again discussing uh, what the solution may be or what they uh, see as a right and a wrong approach to to Palestine and Israel, so perhaps uh, that might have been uh, that might have been the objective to to bring Palestine back uh, on the agenda of, of regional powers in the world. Uh, it's it's a very difficult situation, very difficult questions, hard to answer because of the the complexity of the Israel Palestine issue, but not to get into the history of it and staying with what's happening on the ground at the moment. How does Israel solve the Iranian conundrum? Again, uh, it's it's a challenging one. It's, I'm, I'm sure there are um, there are a lot of people in Israel, uh, qualified and highly paid, who who are uh, trying to figure out just that. Um, I don't think uh, necessarily uh, there is a short term or easy solution for that for when, when it comes to Israel. Um, Iran is, is an established power. Uh, they have uh, sufficient resources, despite the sanctions, uh, to conduct these sort of operations. They have uh, influence across the region. Uh, they're not necessarily accepted as a regional power, but but uh, the the conflict in, in, in Gaza has sort of um, brought some of the uh, regional powers that were originally against Iran to to their. Uh, to, to support their cause, if not Iran to support their cause. So um, it would be a very challenging, uh, challenging uh, situation to navigate for Israel. Um, I don't see any easy solutions here. Um, it, no. It's, uh, it, we will have to wait and see. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm coming back to, to the role of uh, Hezbollah in this regard and, and what they decide uh, when it comes to this, uh, to this uh, uh, war. Um, I think that will determine very much uh, the course of uh, the course of operation going forward. Whether Israel would have to split their forces and fight a war on two fronts, uh, whether there will be uh, further uh, further uh, developments on the ground uh, with regard to Iranian-backed uh, backed uh, um, groups, uh, military groups that operate in the region, uh, it's 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 a very challenging uh, situation. Um, Indeed, I'm, I'm not sure there's an easy solution. Yeah, indeed. It's, uh, it will be very naive of Israel not to think, not to be ready. And they have said, the IDF has said they are ready if that war opens up to a full frontal war on the northern front with Lebanon and Hezbollah. And even if Syria gets involved and if the Houthis keep sending down missiles and drones, it's, they should, it's, we hope it's not going to be 1967 all over again. And this time, we hope that the international community can get their act together, even as far as the United Nations, even though many are, exp are expressing less and less faith in the United States uh, the nations to do anything to make this uh, problem come to an end. As far as the United Nations are concerned, what other measures do you think can be taken up, apart from the, 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 the verbal condemnation and advisory capacity that's been happening? Well, at this point in time, I think humanitarian support for, for people in Gaza, it's, it's, uh, it's something that can certainly uh, be taken forward. Uh, I, we know uh, for a fact that uh, people living in, in, in Palestine right now are uh, suffering. Uh, they, they're really struggling. And that's what we hear from uh, UN officials 
on the ground, um, uh, some the number of uh, hospitals have been targeted. A number of uh, refugee camps have been targeted. There is a lack of water. There's a shortage of water, shortage of food, um, medication. It's it's a serious uh, serious uh, situation, and that's where I think uh, we can agree, uh, regardless of where you stand on on Israel and and Palestine and Hamas. Uh, I think we can agree that uh, the ordinary citizens, ordinary people shouldn't be suffering and shouldn't be dying. Uh, and this is certainly one area where the UN can play a greater role, um, where we can all agree and, and uh, uh, come to, to a solution that, has, that, that, that helps the people. Of course, there are certain challenges uh, on the ground. Uh, some of the neighbors are very slow. Uh, neighbors of, of, of uh, Israel and Palestine are very uh, slow to, to sort of respond and act despite their very categorical position on, on the ongoing war. Um, but this is certainly one area where, where the UN can and should play a role. And I think they've been trying to play a bigger role here. And, and certainly the officials on the ground are very vocal about some of the challenges uh, that, that people are experiencing and they should be resolved. Over 8,000 fatalities we hear from the Gaza Strip, as well as thousands of children who've been killed. Uh, but Israel, at the, at the juncture of the beginning, said that for casualties to be minimized, these civilians should move to the southern part of Gaza. But Hamas said that they should not move to the southern part of Gaza. And the Rafah crossing, crossing hasn't been open to the extent that refugees can come in. And there's also been accusations that Israel wants to depopulate the Strip and using this as a method to do so. Um, uh, yes, uh, there are a number of, of uh, discussions uh, being held. I mean, we, we cannot know for sure, but, but one of the arguments being that uh, to solve the issue of Palestine uh, being a a thorn in, in Israeli side uh, once and for all, um, they, they may just try to essentially create conditions uh, on the ground that are just so unbearable that people would be forced to move elsewhere. And that would solve a lot of, a lot of Israelis, uh, Israeli problems. Uh, they may create conditions uh, on the ground to an extent that, that people are simply cannot live in this area anymore. Um, that's, that's one of the arguments. Of course, I think Israel would deny they, they, they are involved in this. Uh, in this. Um, it's it's also not easy for people to move, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, it's it's also unfair to expect people to abandon their lives uh, and lose lose their possessions and simply become a refugee um, and and hope for the best and hope that uh, neighboring countries uh, uh, care for them and cater for them. Uh, but also, uh, we have to we have to um, accept that there is a very pragmatic approach from Hamas uh, when it comes to this war. They understand that uh, as long as people uh, are living in these areas in in Palestine and in Gaza, uh, that um, Israel would be uh, constrained in terms of uh, the sort of equipment and sort of uh, munition they use. If, if uh, it is just uh, a, a conflict between Hamas and the IDF, the IDF has sufficient resources to, to simply level all the cities and, and destroy all the infrastructure and, and uh, uh, essentially kill um, uh, these, uh, the Hamas fighters from the distance. So it is, it is favoring, um, um, it may sound horrible and pragmatic, but it is favoring Hamas uh, to to uh, to uh, advocate for people to stay in their homes because they know that that will create uh, uh, consideration. They, that, that will create additional pressure on, on Israel uh, in terms of how they conduct this war. It's it's a very it's a very challenging situation on the ground. And um, my concern would be that um, uh, there is a very narrow window of opportunity to handle this this war um, in a diplomatic and political way. And if other uh, other uh, motor groups in, in the region uh, join the war, if other uh, countries in the region join the war, it may it may escalate to the point where a, a diplomatic solution will not be possible for for near in the near future. Um, of course, with with tremendous uh, impact on, on uh, civilian lives in, in Gaza. Finally, Mr. Riva, do you consider Hamas violence tactics as representative of the Palestinian people to solve the Israeli question? Um, so are you, are you asking what I think about these, uh, these tactics? 
Yes. Do you think that the methods that they employ, that this is supported by a large number of the Palestinian people? Well, a few, a few points here. I think, first and foremost, we, we, we're not quite sure how many Palestinians actually support Hamas. Certainly, quite a number of Palestinians do, but uh, I don't think uh, we have a good measure to, to know whether uh, Hamas is indeed representing uh, the people of Palestine, but let's, let's assume that they do. Um, again, it would not be um, up to me to, to sort of make this call. Uh, it's it's It has been going on for a while, the war itself. Before Hamas, uh, there was PLA um, using not similar tactics, but but uh, in, in, in many ways similar tactics. Um, it is ultimately up to the people of, of Palestine to, to see and, and to agree or disagree and then voice their, their opinions on that. Uh, we can certainly understand where, where Hamas is coming from. Uh, it's, it's not a very difficult position to understand. Uh, as far as they're concerned, they've been, uh, they've been living under occupation for a while. And if you, if you have this mindset, it's very easy then to justify using violence um, against uh, Israel. Uh, I, I would, in my personal view, uh, um, I think some of the tactics used by Hamas are questionable. But then again, it is my personal view, and I'm not uh, I'm not living in Gaza. I'm not part of this uh, conflict, so um, it's it's difficult to make this call. I don't know to what extent they're productive uh, or constructive. To what extent they they achieve the purpose, but then again, it's it's their call to make. Thank you, Mr. Riva, for your thoughts this morning. Mr. Dennis Riva is a researcher at the Institute for Security Studies in South Africa. Many thanks for being a part of the program. Thank you for having me. Still ahead. Commissioner General of the United Nations Palestinian Refugee Agency, Felipe Lazzarini, visits Gaza for the first time since the mass attack. Welcome to the second half of today's coverage of the Israel-Hamas war. The conflict has ex was expected to dominate talks during Saudi Defense Minister Prince Khalid bin Salman's meeting with U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin at the Pentagon. Earlier in the week, he and the U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan affirmed the importance of deterring any expansion of the Israel-Hamas war. Mr. Salman wrapped up the day with a meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken at the State Department. The U.S. House, in a bipartisan 222-286 vote, defeated a resolution to censure U.S. Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib after she spoke at a rally that called for a ceasefire in the Israel-Palestine conflict. Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene introduced the resolution on October the 26th, accusing Tlaib of anti-Semitic activity, sympathizing with terrorist organizations, and leading an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol complex. Green's resolution referred to a peaceful demonstration at a House office building during which hundreds of protesters were arrested. Taib, in a statement, called the resolution deeply Islamophobic in her view. Whereas in May 2019, in May 2019, Rashida Tlaib said that she celebrated the Holocaust and felt a calming feeling when thinking about the genocide of millions of Jews. Whereas in 2020, Rashida Tlaib retweeted an illustration with the caption, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And this Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, slogan has been adopted by Hamas and calls for the elimination of Israel and the death of all Jews. Whereas in September 2022, Rashida Tlaib, as a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, displayed her disdain for Israel saying, you cannot claim to hold progressive values, yet back Israel's apartheid government. Whereas instead of denouncing the horrors of Hamas, slaughtering Israelis, and demanding the release of all hostages held by Hamas, 
Rashida Tlaib stated on October 8, 2023, the path to the future must include lifting the blockade, ending the occupation, and dismantling the apartheid system that creates the suffocating, dehumanizing conditions that can lead to resistance. Whereas Rashida Tlaib exhibited her hatred for America by reposting a message on October 12, 2023, blaming America for allowing the deaths of Palestinian babies at the hands of Israel. Whereas Rashida Tlaib led an insurrection at the United States Capitol Complex on October 18, 2023, which put members of Congress, their staffs, and Capitol visitors in danger by shutting down elevators, stairwells, and points of egress, while obstructing official business in both the House of Representatives and the Senate, including a Senate Foreign Affairs Committee hearing, whereas the insurrection led by Rashida Tlaib was organized by Jewish Voice for Peace, which the Anti-Defamation League calls a radical anti-Israel activist group that advocates for a complete economic, cultural, and academic boycott of the state of Israel, and that believes Israeli policies and actions are motivated by deeply rooted Jewish racial chauvinism and religious supremacism. The motion is on the motion offered by the gentlewoman from Massachusetts. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Yes. It appears the no's have it. Beijing's ambassador to the United Nations has made it clear that resolving the Israel-Palestinian question is a top priority for China as it assumes the Security Council's presidency in November. China's United Nations ambassador Zhang Jun told the news conference on Wednesday that the country will make efforts towards a ceasefire in Gaza and seek to de-escalate tensions in the region. China also reiterated its support for a two-state solution. Vetoes from the U.S., China and Russia have seen previous resolutions on the conflict fail to pass the Security Council. The top priority for our presidency and also for the Security Council as a whole currently is to tackle the uh, Israel-Palestinian question, namely the Gaza uh, conflict, which is uh, going on in the Middle East. For the presidency, uh, what we will continue to work is to uh, really to make further efforts to make sure that the Council can play a respons uh, responsible and a meaningful role in particularly calling for ceasefire, protecting the civilians, and avoiding or preventing the further deterioration of the tension and also further humanitarian catastrophes. In the opinion of Pope Francis, a two-state solution is needed for Israel and Palestine in order to put an end to wars such as the current one. He's calling for a special status for Jerusalem. In an interview with Italian state television, Pope Francis also says he hopes a regional escalation could be avoided in the conflict. He's concerned about the rise in anti-Semitism, much of which he says remains hidden. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is expected to travel to Israel and Jordan on Friday. Addressing reporters, State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller added that the Secretary of State Anthony Blinken will meet with leaders of the Israeli government, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, for an update on their military objectives. Secretary Blinken will travel to Israel and Jordan on Friday. The Secretary will meet with Prime Minister Netanyahu and other leaders of the Israeli government to receive an update on their military objectives and their plans for meeting those objectives. He will reiterate U.S. support for Israel's right to defend itself in accordance with international humanitarian law and discuss the need to take all precautions to minimize civilian casualties, as well as our work to deliver humanitarian assistance. A university student accused of making online threats against Jewish students at the Ivy League school appeared in court on Wednesday and was ordered to remain in jail. Patrick Dye, 21 years of age, did not enter a plea in the Syracuse courtroom. He was remanded in custody of U.S. Marshal after Marshal status after the prosecutors moved to detain him as a flight risk and danger risk. A federal complaint was discharged him with posting threats to kill or injure another person using interstate communications.
uh, that this is a threat that is uh, reaching in some ways sort of historic levels, um, in part because, uh, as you know all too well, the Jewish community uh, is targeted by terrorists really across the spectrum, homegrown violent extremists, foreign terrorist organizations, both Sunni and Shia, domestic violent extremists, uh, and in fact, our statistics would indicate that for a group that represents only about 2.4 percent of the American public, they account for something like 60 percent of all religious-based hate crimes. We assess that the actions of Hamas and its allies will serve as an inspiration the likes of which we haven't seen since ISIS launched its so-called caliphate several years ago. In just the past few weeks, multiple foreign terrorist organizations have called for attacks against Americans and the West. The head of the United Nations Palestinian Refugee Agency visited Gaza on Wednesday for the first time since Israel started bombarding the Strip on October the 7th following the deadly attack by Hamas. Earlier this week, the UNRWA Commissioner General Felipe Lazzarini warned the Security Council that Palestinians in the besieged city uh, were being subjected to forced displacement and collective punishment. Medical authorities in Hamas run Gaza, which has a population of 2.3 million people, put the number of dead people at over 8,000 people, including thousands of children. I never ever have seen something similar in Gaza when I came before, after conflict. I also came here to meet my staff, to express uh, my admiration uh, to all the frontliners. They were drawing my attention today about uh, the real lack of food, the lack of water, the lack of fuel, and we know fuel here in Gaza is absolutely everything, because without fuel, you do not have generator, you do not have functioning bakery, you do not have a functioning uh, hospital, um, and uh, you cannot uh, pump uh, water. They were asking me to continue to advocate uh, to bring the humanitarian operation at scale here in Gaza, but they were also all asking me to continue to convey the message that more than ever, to succeed in scaling up, uh, we need uh, an humanitarian cause. We need an humanitarian ceasefire. Joining us now is Professor David Aurao from the Department of History and Strategic Studies, University of Lagos, speaking to us virtually from Akoka in Lagos, Southwest Nigeria. Good morning and thank you for being with us. Program. So if you can hear me, um, let's begin from the UN. RWA Commissioner General Felipe Lazzarini, who says that collective punishment is being heaped on the Gazans. The conditions there are dire. We understand that there has been looting at one of the warehouses uh, yesterday or the day before. There is so much hunger, there is so much thirst. Supplies are running low in spite of the fact that over 24 aid trucks have now entered Gaza, 14 before that and before that as well it appears there seems to be a trickling in of these supplies, but is it enough to make a difference? And what is your impression of the situation currently at the Gaza Strip? Uh, thank you once again. Um, the situation is clear for all to see. Uh, is that of misery? Is that of extreme suffering? Uh, the condition is there. Uh, supplies are trickling in, as you have said, but they are grossly inadequate. Um, when you look at the supplies coming in, uh, compared with what is needed for the people to be able to take care of their basic needs, uh, there is a wide gap in between. So uh, it is very easy to understand uh, why uh, there is extensive suffering in Gaza. Um, you know, uh, because uh, the, the, you know the normal condition of life cannot go on in the condition of war. And uh, humanitarian supplies, uh, you know, have been grossly inadequate. So that gap translates to misery and suffering uh, for the people of Gaza. How do you interpret what's happening in the United States now as per the anti-Semitic activities purportedly of certain individuals and certain groups and the protests 
uh, for the Palestinians, some of which take a violent dimension. Uh, the, and we, heard, uh, we just heard about the, the student uh, who's been arrested uh, for, for making threatening statements. Is this rise, can, is, is there, can we say categorically now that there is a rise in this anti-Semitic activity? The Christopher Ray, um, the FBI director, says he's very fearful of, of uh, a repeat occurrence of terror attacks on United States soil. Uh, well, hopefully it will not uh, get to that. But when you have uh, this kind of condition where there are extreme positions um, the Palestinians and the Arab supporters are extreme in their disposition towards Israel in the aftermath of uh, the attack on the 7th of October. And uh, when you also see uh, what uh, you know, Israel has done on this side and what Hamas did on the other <laughs> side, um, tempers are flaring and uh, it is not difficult to understand why uh, people are taking extreme measures uh, to this. You recall the other time that uh, a Jewish man stabbed an Arab, an Arab boy, stabbed him severally and uh, got him killed. These people have lived together peacefully for a long time. So tempers are flaring, and uh, it is not difficult to understand why there is this rising uh, anti-Semitism. But hopefully when um, a ceasefire is negotiated and a ceasefire is uh, agreed to, and, and you know, things uh, go down in the, I mean, the violence reduces in Gaza, uh, hopefully, tempers will uh, not be as high as they are now, and things will gradually simmer down. I, I do not expect uh, all of this leading to terrorist attack in the United States, but of course, uh, the U.S. needs to be uh, uh, vigilant, because these are the kind of things that will create the condition for uh, people to want to organize uh, a terror attack. Uh, but it is unfortunate, and it is this extreme position that, uh, uh, you know, must, must uh, be done away with for a solution to this conflict, you know, to be found. It is not only manifested in individual responses. Even the way countries have also responded, people who, who, who were abhorred, I mean, people who, who expressed a revulsion when Hamas did what it did on 7th of October, are not expressing so much, uh, you know, uh, 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 condemnation to the indiscriminate attacks and the killings that are taking place in Gaza. Humans are the same everywhere. So both at the individual level and at the state level, there needs to be, you know, reasonableness in addressing this, this conflict so that some solution can be found very quickly moving forward. What kind, of, what kind of solution do you think will bring this to a ceasefire? Well, um, I'm happy about uh, the Chinese, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, the Chinese will take over the uh, chairmanship of the United Nations Security Council in the next uh, couple of days. And uh, they seem to be determined to ensure that uh, a ceasefire that will be acceptable to both sides will be negotiated and drafted. Uh, four have been drafted already, all of them failed. And that takes me back to the comment I made earlier regarding the need to tone down extreme positions, including the US, Britain, and other, yeah, the United Kingdom and other countries. I mean, um, see the, 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 the what the, the Brazilian drew up, they could have been amended and we'll find a, a way around it. The, the, the United States, vetoed it, that is what needs to change, these extreme positions. Because this war has brought nobody any good. Um, it is true, Hamas needs to be dealt with. Uh, now, Hamas needs to be gone after. But, I mean, attacks do not have to be indiscriminate. So both on the sides of those who support Israel, Israel itself, and countries that support Israel, and Hamas, and the Arab countries that support her, there needs to be reasonableness. They need to tone down, you know, their extreme position, so that when the United Nations Security Council draws up the next, uh, uh, you know, resolution uh, and there's some agreement for ceasefire, they should look at it, you know, areas where there are disagreements should be uh, worked out, amended, so that there can be, you know, some agreement that will be agreed to, to, to for a ceasefire to be, uh, uh, to, to be in place. Right now, Netanyahu is saying no to a ceasefire. Uh, Biden and the rest of them should be able to speak with Netanyahu to say, look, uh, where we have reached now, we need to, you know, step back, see how we can, you know, negotiate a ceasefire, and then we'll take, the, take it from there. Uh, this thing has been on for 75 years, and it's never going to end uh, in just uh, a few days. Uh, that is what I think needs to happen uh, for the, this war to be brought to an end, at least for now, and other things can then follow. 
Do you think China will take an impartial view at the chairmanship of the Security Council when they've been openly critical of the Israeli government? Um, I think so. I think so because uh, the, China does not want escalation. The Chinese, the interest of China is for global stability to be in place, for them to be able to promote their economic development. You see that uh, Hezbollah has already been attacked by Israel in, in Lebanon. The thing is already spreading to uh, the other time, Jenny, Hebron in the West Bank. We also at, the thing is spreading, it's escalating. Turkey is taking very strong stance against uh, the West and Israel. Uh, you know, uh, in the aftermath of the, you know, uh, thousands of deaths in, in, in Gaza. So all of this, I think, will influence China to maintain a more neutral position on, on, on this matter so that some solution can be found moving forward. And by the way, uh, the Chinese will take over the chairmanship of uh, the Security uh, Council, but of course, the other 14 members that will join China are also there. So I would imagine that, you know, uh, uh, there will be robust discussions and they will be able to reach a middle position on this matter. And which is why we're appealing to countries like the United States and the United Kingdom, strong supporters of Israel, to maintain reasonableness so that some ceasefire can be negotiated and Israel can be persuaded to accept it. Um, and then the other things can follow. We, I mean, a lot of what about, about, what about appealing to countries like Qatar and Iran and Lebanon? Uh, Lebanon harboring Hezbollah to the degree that they are, Qatar with the position that they, they're taking. It seems you're making out Israel to be the aggressor, and the United States uh, no. are, are, are instigating them further. Not, not exactly so. Qatar is more moderate than Iran. Actually, Iran should be the actually focus of persuasion. Uh, Qatar is more moderate. Uh, Qatar, Qatar and uh, Lebanon are more, and I'm sure they, are, they will be easier to persuade, to accept you know, some uh, position that will bring this country to an end than Iran. Iran pretends is not fully involved, but we all know that Iran is fully involved. So countries that are close to Iran, China should be able to influence and persuade Iran to, to, to uh, tone down its support for you know, uh, uh, Hamas and other uh, militant groups in this matter. That is the core of the issue, actually. And of course, the, the, the broader picture is um, two-state solution. It's about land, actually. Land in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, <laughs> I'm surprised that a land that can be shared has become a subject of contention for 35 years. And there's no, I mean, there seems to be no way forward. So the submission is that uh, countries like Qatar and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Lebanon, those ones would be easier to persuade. Iran is more hard, it's a more hardline uh, uh, country on this matter. China should be able to influence Iran to be more reasonable. And of course, on the other side, as we are saying, the United States, the United Kingdom, and all these other countries too, need to take a step back when all of this takes place, then some solution in the, in the short run can then be negotiated. The long-term thing is for them to agree on these two states solution, two states that will respect each other and work with each other for their own development and global development. That is the ultimate solution to this crisis. And we hope peace sees the light of day. We thank you, uh, Sir Professor David Aurawa, Department of History and Strategic Studies, University of Lagos, for coming on the program. Thank you very much for having me. Have a nice day. Still to come. Madrid candlelight vigil pays tribute to Palestinian victims on all... Welcome back. Dozens of injured people were transported to Egypt through the Rafah crossing yesterday. This transfer had been anticipated for some time. Qatar had brokered a deal between Egypt, Israel and Hamas to allow limited evacuations from the Gaza Strip. 81 people were lined up for this trip, some of them seriously injured. Mourners held a funeral on Wednesday in southern Lebanon municipality of Yatar for 16-year-old civilian Ali Kourani, who was killed in what residents called an Israeli drone attack. Tension on the southern border of Lebanon between Hezbollah and Israel have increased since Hamas's unprecedented attack on Israel on October the 7th. Hezbollah reports four civilians have been killed over the past few weeks near the Lebanese-Israeli border. 
Finally, hundreds of demonst demonstrators took part in a candlelight vigil in Madrid on All Saints Day in memory of the Palestinian victims of the conflict between Israel and Hamas. The protesters gathered in central Madrid where they accused Israel of committing genocide in Gaza and held a banner saying, End Genocide. And that's it for this morning's coverage of Israel Hamas war. Thank you for watching. I'm Aluminium Coin.